The next talk is by Nicola Gentile Fusilo, who seems to have lost his surname in the printed programme. I'll give you a warning after 10 minutes. To... Okay. Yeah, thank you, everyone. So I'm Nicola from the University of Warwick, and I'm going to talk about the work I've done with the help of a lot of people in uh, selecting white dwarfs out of Gaia Data List 2. So first of all, uh, no next. Okay. So what are white dwarfs? Um, well, there are the still remnants left over from the evolution of main sequence stars with masses between 0 0.8 and roughly 8 solar masses. And this is a range that actually includes over 90% of all stars in the galaxy. White dwarfs are very dense objects. They have about the size of the Earth and on average, they all have 0 0.6 solar masses. Keep this number in mind. Because of this high density, the outer atmosphere of white dwarfs is purely composed of the lightest elements, so either hydrogen or helium, and therefore the spectral appearance of most white dwarfs is like this. So a continuum where the only features we see are these gravitationally broadened hydrogen lines. Because of their unique properties, white dwarfs are actually very useful tools in a variety of areas of astronomy. Accreting white dwarfs, for example, are the progenitor of type 1a supernovae, uh, white dwarfs are useful for measuring ages of different stellar populations, and some rare white dwarfs are even used in uh, exoplanetary science. However, because they are small, they are intrinsically faint, and so historically, constructing large catalogues of white dwarfs has been quite challenging. Before Gaia, uh, the situation was uh, the, this one. What I'm showing here are all of the white dwarfs that were known before Gaia. It's about 33,000 of them. And catalogs at the time were very incomplete and biased. And as you can see in this plot, they were actually strongly dominated by the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. And you can actually recognize the footprint of Sloan in this plot. Furthermore, less than 15% of all the known white dwarfs were actually located in the southern hemisphere. So a very incomplete and biased sample. But then Gaia came along. Uh, not so much DR1, uh, was a bit disappointing. It only had six white dwarfs in it. But DR2, with this, uh, Parallax, proper motions, and colors for over 1.3 billion stars was the turning point. So all we had to do was uh, make a nature diagram like this one, and then simply select these objects, which should be all of the white walls. Of course, the real world is never that easy, it's never that nice, and actually selecting all white walls is a bit more complicated than that. Uh, so first of all, we had to understand the entire parameter space that white walls can span in the HR diagram of Gaia. So what we did was um, recover some of the known white dwarfs from the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, cross-match them with Gaia, and uh, put them in the HR diagram. Uh, and if you're wondering why this HR diagram doesn't look anything like the one I showed before, it's because at this stage we're pretty much not applying any quality filtering to the data. So there is a lot of scatter here. The objects in blue are the white dwarfs from the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, and these objects allowed us to define these red cuts, which simply define the area within which we then carry out further selection. And this further selection, uh, first of all, needed some cleaning. Uh, we relied on some of the Gaia flags, mainly parallax over error, photometric BPRP excess factor, which we just heard of, astrometric sigma 5D max, which, roughly speaking, can help you spot when things have gone wrong in the five-parameter solution of Gaia, and astrometric excess noise, which can flag objects with less reliable parallax measurements. By using these uh, flags to filter the data, we brought the sample down from the 8 million objects that were included in, by these cats down to about 800,000. And that's when we spotted uh, something that we were not expecting. Uh, what I'm showing here are all these 800,000 objects. And actually, the objects in red are all either in the Magellanic Cloud, all of these, or these are highly scattered objects from the galactic plane. So, as we heard, we found out that Gaia could actually struggle quite a bit in crowded areas of the sky. To fix this, we defined a new parameter, which we call density, and it, roughly speaking, indicates the number of objects in the square degree around our object of interest. Using this density parameter, we are able to isolate crowded areas of the sky, impose stricter quality cuts, and we managed to remove the Magellanic clouds and problematic objects from the galactic plane, bringing the sample down to the final size of 439,658 objects. Great, except we still didn't know which one were the white dwarfs at this stage. So again, we went back to Sloan, cross-matched all of these objects with the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, retrieved spectra for all of them, inspected them, and classified them as white dwarfs or not white dwarfs. And what we find are 
20,759 by those, and just under 2,500 other objects, contaminants, which is what I'm showing in these plots with the white dose in blue and the contaminants in red. And immediately we can see that actually they don't perfectly separate and there is no magic line I can trace in here to include all of the white dwarfs while rejecting all the contaminants at the same time. So we needed a different approach. We decided to actually use the distribution of the known white dwarfs and contaminants to construct a probability map that then allows us to calculate a parameter, which we call a probability of being a white dwarf, for every Gaia object in that area. The result of this is uh, illustrated in this plot, where these are all of the 400,000 objects I just mentioned, and the gradient of color actually indicates their probability of being a white dwarf, and we get this smooth transition. At this stage, I want to issue a warning, though. Uh, you may have understood that the cross-matching with Sloan was uh, of key importance for this work, and some of you may be aware that in Data Release 2, there were some tables of official cross-matches provided between Sloan and Gaia. However, these are not complete. Uh, I personally found thousands of Sloan objects with perfectly reliable matches in Gaia, which are simply not included in these tables. So if you are using these tables, uh, be careful. So with these probabilities, it's then possible to select subsamples of objects from my catalog, uh, attempting to retrieve high confidence white dwarf candidates. Of course, you have to keep in mind that any cut you make will always be a compromise between uh, completeness and efficiency. But uh, generally speaking, uh, we estimate our catalog contains roughly 260,000 white dwarfs. This is an eight-fold increment compared to the number of white dwarfs that were known before Gaia, which is illustrated in uh, these plots, which are the sky density of white dwarfs before Gaia, the 33,000 I mentioned before, and now, if you're using my catalog, with 260,000 objects. Uh, at this point, we also realized that we needed to do something else because the Number of white, the white dwarfs we had before Gaia came from a mix of surveys, and the naming convention was actually a bit of a mess. So we decided to come up with uh, a new naming convention for all of the objects in our catalog, which is purely based on Gaia and uses just the Gaia coordinates and actually proper motions. Um, some of you may have spotted that in this plot, the sky density of uh, Gaia white dwarfs, there is a lot of structure, a lot of overdense areas. This is actually due to the fact that we had before that the Gaia limiting magnitude is uh, actually a function of sky position, which is better illustrated in this plot I made from my catalog. This is the limiting magnitude of Gaia in uh, 10 square degree bins. And as you can see, there is uh, a lot of structure and we can recognize the pattern of the Gaia scanning laws. In fact, only about three quarters of the sky as seen by Gaia reach a limiting magnitude of 20. But this also means that as this map becomes more uniform in, further in the future data releases of Gaia, we should be able to identify more fainter white dwarfs, or in general, more fainter any object. So since now we had this uh, very nice large sample of white dwarfs to play with, Gaia actually allows us to explore this further. So a good starting point for this characterization is the 100 parsec neighborhood. So what I'm showing here, this is actually the same plot twice, are all of the white dwarfs selected from a catalog within 100 parsec. The only difference between left and right here is that the lines over here are the cooling tracks for hydrogen atmosphere white dwarfs, and these are the cooling tracks for helium atmosphere white dwarfs. I want to draw through your attention to three particular features, because there is a lot of structure in here. And these are this line, uh, this other curve underneath it, distinct from it, and perhaps better visible here, there is a transverse feature. Since we already cross-matched our Gaia catalog with the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, we have a few spectra that can allow us to further characterize the structure. And that's what I'm attempting to do in these plots. Uh, this diagram over here is just to keep in mind uh, the features I mentioned before. So here, in blue, I'm showing hydrogen atmosphere white dwarfs from the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, and we can immediately see that the majority of them cluster along the first line, for along this first feature I mentioned before. These are, in fact, the hydrogen atmosphere were those of typical mass, the 0 0.6 I mentioned before. So this is simply the cooling track of uh, typical mass hydrogen atmosphere were those. Similarly, the second feature is where a lot of the helium atmosphere were those really narrowly cluster. And again, this is uh, just the cooling track of typical mass, the 0 0.6 I mentioned before, helium atmosphere white dwarfs. 
So perhaps more interesting is this third feature, this transversal line, which can actually see some object clustering on it over here. Uh, this is not a separate population of objects. It's not parallel to the other two tracks, so it cannot be the cooling track of a different type of wild wolf. As it turns out, this is a pile-up effect due to something called crystallization. As wild wolves of different masses cool down following cooling tracks which are parallel to this, their core can undergo a phase transition which releases uh, latent energy and slows down their cooling. So if you have a wild wolf that is cooling along here, it hits this crystallization uh, stage and it stops in its cooling, creating this pile-up and so this transversal feature. This theory of crystallization had actually been known for a long time, but we never had a direct observation or evidence for it. And we were certainly not expecting to get for free just by looking at the Gaia HR diagram. Uh, of course, there is a lot more things that we can spot in this HR diagram. I simply don't have time to talk about. For example, here I'm showing magnetic white dwarfs, which seem to all populate an area which is below the 0 0.6 uh, track perhaps indicating that magnetic white dwarfs are more massive than their counterparts. Uh, in magenta here, I'm showing uh, some rare type of white dwarfs called the hot TQs, which are thought to come from mergers, and they all seem to cluster in the same spot. So there is a lot that can be spotted. So what I want to point out is that, yes, Gaia is great and allows us to select all these samples of white dwarfs and looking at them, but we still need the spectroscopy in order to actually characterize these samples. Fortunately, uh, we're sitting on the verge of a change in the way we do spectroscopy because uh, the next generation multi-object spectrographs are about to come online. I'm talking about uh, WEAVE, which will go on the WHT in the Canary Islands, uh, DESI, which we mounted on the Mile telescope at Cape Peak, FORMOST, which will go on VISTA in Paranel, and Sloan 5, which will actually be the only one covering both the North and the Southern Hemisphere. Using my catalog, we're already providing the input target list uh, for these, uh, for all of these multi-object spectrographs, and hopefully these in the next few years will provide the bulk of all of the Gaia spectroscopic follow-up. And with this, I would like to finish. Uh, just uh, if you're interested, I invite you to go here and go and retrieve my catalogs, and I don't know, maybe you have a use for a few hundred thousand white wolves. <laughs> Thank you. Questions? You seem to have told everybody everything that they need to know about white dwarfs. Just, uh, Sorry. Uh, Simon Hodgkin, Cambridge. Uh, you mentioned that uh, there were a lot of, in the produced tables for in the ESA archive, that there were missing objects in the SDSS versus GDR2 crossmatch. Yes. What might that be due to? Uh, I have no idea. So I looked at proper motions, I looked at the Sloan quality flags, I looked at the Gaia quality flags, and I looked at sky position. I simply don't know how these objects went missing. And uh, actually this is also true for the Wise cross match and the Panstar cross match with Gaia. Nene Outmeyer from Leeds. Yeah, we had exactly the same problem where we were cross matching. Turns out that they really went for quality rather than quantity. So they went for, I don't know, some sort of quality factor of, let's say, 99.99%, which led them to miss a lot of objects. I think that's the reason. Not sure whether I would have done it, but <laughs> that's what the choice they made. Just one last question. Uh, Tim Naylor, Exeter. Um, we went through the cross matches. Um, Tom Wilson and I, and we've written a paper um, which is now in monthly notices where we do a cross match with Wise and we in there explain what we think is going on with the Gaia cross matching. Okay, thank you very much.